It is really a great privilege to have the opportunity to speak with Reed alumni here in Southern California this morning. And, uh, and I, a question has been posed to me with respect to uh, how would I define Reed and in what ways did, did Reed define me. And in the best Reed tradition, I'm going to dodge the question completely. Uh, <laughs> But, but I, I do want to reflect on the fact that um, it, almost exactly 40 years ago, well not quite 40 years ago, I matriculated at, at Reed College. And so we can, at this moment, pause and, and look back at the college a bit. I, I'll say one thing about uh, the aging process, which all of us are experiencing. Um, you kind of recognize as the years go by that the institutions and organizations and buildings and businesses that you're associated with, um, after a while, uh, you've actually been associated with them for a substantial fraction of their period on Earth. And this came to me in a particularly Southern California moment. Uh, for, for, for some time, I, I was involved at the periphery of the Los Angeles music scene as, as a young man. And um, there were a bunch of us who lived in Laurel Canyon, and I used to always eat at the DuPars in Studio City. Everybody knows this. And, and I was there not too long ago, and they were celebrating their 75th anniversary. And I realized that um, I had been eating their blueberry cream cheese pie for more than half of their existence. And um, as one of my friends cheekily commented, that was nothing to be proud of. <laughs> um, but, you know, 40 years now association with Reed College, I'm very proud of that. And uh, if fortune smiles and if the actuaries are right, uh, in about 20 years, I'll have the opportunity to say that I've been associated with Reed for more than half of its existence, uh, which will then give me, I think, real clarity about Reed's um, strengths and uh, its um, aspirations. It seems to me, when I look back at my own engagement with Reed, and when I think about those who attended Reed in the generation before mine, many of whom I've had the privilege of meeting in one context or another. And when I meet Reed students now, that they all share something very much in common, which Lorraine referred to. Students at Reed are, you know, they're fun to talk to. And people who've been at Reed are fun to talk to. And the reason is, in part, it seems to me, because at Reed they learned to develop and defend a point of view to develop and defend a point of view. And that makes them engaging, because the adventures of ideas are actually important. And it is that salient characteristic, along with a couple of others that I'll mention, that it seems to me is critical to the Reed experience, is the thing that in a way defines Reed and in a way defines all of us who've been through it. Now, I arrived at Reed in August of 1969. Um, I had found out about Reed uh, as, a, as a boy in Colorado, where I grew up, by thumbing sort of haphazardly through college catalogs at the high school. And uh, there was a picture of a dog on the front of the catalog. I liked the picture. Uh, <laughs> that was sort of the intensity of my affiliation with the college. Um, my wife, who turned down Radcliffe to go to Reed, liked the picture too. So you might want to look at that picture. It's an important one. Uh, and so I arrived at Reed in, in August of 1969. It was the first time I'd ever seen the campus. Um, never visited. My class enrolled in an era of great rebellion, as many of you will recall. And this was an extremely difficult time for the college, as is described in the recent edition of the Reed Magazine, for those of you who have seen it, because of the tension between the traditionalists and the progressives, which was everywhere evident uh, on the campus. Shortly after I arrived, a student boycott was staged, which literally brought the college to its knees. And President Victor Rosenblum, by all accounts a decent man, uh, came to the, the commons to address the community and said, I do not come to you as a man on a horse. And within a few months, he'd resigned. The, the college seemed to be teetering on the brink. 50% of my class left by the end of the first semester. 50% left by the end of the first semester. And as Marvin Levitch 
recounts in the Reed magazine, there, there was a sense indeed that liberal education might be teetering on the brink as a result of the pressure for relevance. When I was at Reed as a freshman, I had an idea about relevance. I decided that I wanted to build a gyrocopter. That was my idea of relevance. Um, and uh, let me be clear about this. My thought was at a small private countercultural liberal arts college in Portland, Oregon, one ought to be able to get college credit for building an aircraft. That just seemed to make sense to me. Um, and uh, so I looked around, I thought, this is sort of a physics kind of thing. So um, I went in search of a physicist, and I found uh, Nick Wheeler. It seemed to me that this was the sort of thing that a professor like Nick Wheeler, who was then the youngest member of the physics faculty, would be sensitive to. <clears throat> that he would be receptive to the idea that, you know, I want to do this. So I went to speak with Nick Wheeler, and uh, he, he was not receptive to the idea. <laughs> he had a bunch of ideas of his own. I was not very receptive to them. And I have to say that when I entered Reed, I was interested in literature, and I had actually not much use for the natural sciences. And by the time I left Reed, I was interested in chemistry and physics. So if the measure of an education, I've heard this statement attributed to Mark Twain, is the amount of change it introduces in an individual, I got a pretty good education at Reed because I changed a lot, a lot in that process. And I have to say that Nick Wheeler's ideas over time and mine became so aligned, and in some respects, that's the reason why I ended up at Washington University School of Medicine. So let me explain that. 